Well, thank you very much, Filippo, and thank you very much for inviting me to the Jean Lico. First time, indeed. So I'm very grateful for that and very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to read the paper, if you can stand that, but I've got some examples we'll run through. You can look at the screen and so on, so I hope it's not too intolerable. What I'm going to do is introduce and briefly characterize a relatively new branch of analytical aesthetics, which has come to be termed the philosophy of poetry. This designation fits the familiar pattern of topic divisions within aesthetics, like the philosophy of visual arts, philosophy of music, and so on. But just when aestheticians are getting used to another recent subdivision, namely the philosophy of literature, here comes a sub-branch of that focused on poetry. So what is it exactly? Is there any genuine intellectual space for it? After all, there seems no need for a philosophy of the novel because questions about the novel are already accommodated in the philosophy of literature. Does poetry merit its own slot where the novel does not? But the simple fact is, given its current focus, the philosophy of literature has virtually become the philosophy of the novel, with its emphasis on topics like narrative, fictionality, imaginative resistance, reference, character and agency, emotional <coughs> response, empathy, ethical content, and so forth. And these are not topics, at least as I see it, that have a central bearing on poetry. In a word, philosophy of literature has not served poetry well. So there's space, I think, for a distinct philosophy of poetry, at least in a substantially expanded conception of philosophy of literature. Well, my aim is not, not to give a history of the philosophy of poetry. There are plenty of precursors in the history of philosophy from Aristotle to Heidegger that might anticipate such a designation. But my interest is narrower still in attending only to the contribution, if any, that analytical philosophy, or specifically analytic aesthetics, might make to a philosophy of poetry. What do I mean by analytic here? Well, I think that's best shown by demonstration in the discussion that follows. It's partly methodological or procedural, partly a matter of questions raised, and partly the use of resources from other areas of analytic philosophy. As for aesthetics, I conceive it broadly as a value inquiry, ultimately one that seeks to characterize and find value in peculiar kinds of sensuous or imaginative experience. The aesthetic realm is not coextensive with the artistic realm. Philosophy of poetry as a branch of aesthetics is also about value and also, I suggest, about kinds of experience. So the inquiry I'm engaged in rests on two principal questions. What is distinctive about poetry among the literary arts? And what are the fundamental values of poetry? And I'm going to approach this through six sub-topics, if you like, that illustrate, as I see it, some of the core issues in philosophy of poetry. Definition, <coughs> paraphrase, and form content unity, experience, interpretation, expression, <coughs> and truth and profundity. And I'll say a little bit about each of those. First, then, definition. Analytical aesthetics 
has often seemed obsessed with definition, finding, if you like, necessary and sufficient conditions. Yet not many sustained attempts have been made by analytic philosophers to define poetry, and there's certainly no broad consensus. Perhaps the demand for definition is less pressing in this case, given that poems, on the whole, are easy enough to recognize. However, attempts at definition, even by literary critics, are rarely without controversy. For example, the critic Terry Eagleton offers a rough and ready in a definition, which he suggests might turn out to be the best we can do, namely this. A poem is a fictional, verbally inventive, moral statement in which it's the author rather than the printer or word processor who decides where the lines should end. Yet that, I think, is flawed on many counts. It's far from clear that poetry needs to be either fictional or moral, or in any sense a statement. And here we're simply confronted by the inexhaustible diversity of poetry. Epic, lyric, dramatic, narrative, confessional, satirical, rhymed, non-rhymed, nonsense poems, prose poems, concrete poems, and so it goes on. It looks as if in Wittgenstein's terms, we have just a family of cases overlapping, crisscrossing, but without any essence. Well, in fact, I think that another of Wittgenstein's notions, that of a practice, affords the most helpful approach in a philosophy of poetry. Rather than focusing on definition, we should, I suggest, attend to the practice or practices of those who engage with poetry. No doubt there's some culture relativity here, but at a generic level, the practice-based approach involves identifying attitudes, expectations, responses, or judgments that are conventionally or characteristically brought to bear on poetry by knowledgeable practitioners, like poets, readers, commentators, and those who appreciate or find value or pleasure in poetry. This, I think, is not a sociological inquiry, but an analytical one. And it might even be conceived, rather grandly, in Kantian transcendental terms, asking what reading and appreciative protocols must be in place if poetry is possible. Without any established practice with its own concepts and conventions, there would be no distinction between poetry and non-poetry and no way to identify the values of poetry. Some simple facts about the practice are easy to discern. Whatever a poem might look or sound like, if we take it as a poem, we bring to it a distinctive kind of attention as broadly determined by the poetic tradition. We assume, for example, that the surface language itself is salient, that its physical textures sound, rhythm, meter, repetitions, rhymes, are not merely incidental, but integral to our attention, to be appreciated in their own right, not just as vehicles for, but as identifying conditions of the content conveyed. We attend to the thoughts embodied in a poem through this precise mode of articulation. If we know that this is, as it were, the game that's played, then our responses are shaped accordingly. But of course, those who create poetry anticipate such responses, either actively inviting them or in different ways attempting to subvert or problematize them. 
This idea from Wittgenstein of grounding the understanding of a concept, in this case the concept poetry, within a more or less loosely rule-guided practice is now a familiar move in analytic aesthetics and the philosophy of literature. And it's certainly one that I've employed in some of my own work in the philosophy of literature. In a word, then, my suggestion is that the philosophy of poetry can profitably be seen as the exploration of a practice, not the search for a definition. And in effect, it's on that assumption that I will proceed in what follows. So my second heading, paraphrase and form content unity. If we're looking for what is distinctive about poetry among the literary arts, a good place to start is that prominent feature in the practice that I've just mentioned. The fact that in the recognition of poetry as poetry, surface aspects of language become salient to be appreciated in their own right, not just as a vehicle for conveying content. There are two related debates about poetic meaning concerning paraphrase and concerning the supposed indivisibil indivisibility of form and content that seem peculiar to poetry in this regard, but they are potentially problematic for analytical approaches. T.S. Eliot described as a commonplace the idea that, in his words, the meaning of a poem may wholly escape paraphrase. The resistance of poetry to paraphrase, or at least the problem of paraphrase, arises from the simple thought that to try to capture in different words what a poem is saying would be to abandon precisely what gives the poem its interest and its very identity. The point follows again from that basic protocol of reading poetry under which the language of a poem invites attention to itself. Analytic philosophers, of course, have a central interest in meaning. So the thought that there is a linguistic usage such that the meaning of a sentence can be expressed in only one way is both intriguing and puzzling. It's a fundamental principle in the philosophy of language when language is considered as a vehicle for thought that there must be different ways, in principle, in which the very same thought might, might be expressed. If that principle does not apply to poetry, we might infer either that poetic usage is not primarily a vehicle for thought, or that the notion of the same thought, i.e. the identity conditions for thought, needs revising in the case of poetry. Well, the debate about paraphrase and poetry is rife with confusion. What is the status of the claim that poetry may wholly escape paraphrase in T.S. Eliot's words? Is it an empirical claim to the effect that however hard readers try, they're just not able to come up with adequate paraphrases? Is it a matter of degree with some poems easier than others to paraphrase? Or is it some kind of necessary truth such that it's impossible in principle to come up with a precise paraphrase? Or is it more like a prescription avoid trying to paraphrase poetry? Well, on reflection, it seems that none of those is quite right. Well, there's been some interest from analytical philosophers in recent years on the question of poetry and paraphrase. Peter Kivy, for example, has argued that paraphrase is not a special problem for poetry once it's recognized what criteria of sameness of meaning are appropriate. If it's demanded of paraphrase that it involves the reproduction of the poem's total effect on the reader, then of course, so Kivy claims, paraphrase is impossible. 
But such a criterion is nonsensical, he thinks, because it demands of paraphrase something that never was the object of the exercise in the first place. But arguably, although Kivy appeals to a common sense conception of paraphrase, roughly sharing the same meaning, he's not got to the heart of what is problematic about paraphrase and poetry. For one thing, he associates paraphrase too closely with interpretation. We'll come later, and to say something later, to interpretation. And interpretation, I think, is quite different from paraphrase as normally understood. And also, when the literary critic Clienth Brooks coined the famous phrase, heresy of paraphrase, he was not saying what can or cannot be done, but what should or should not be done. For Brooks, the heresy is to think that at the core of each poem is some abstractable and paraphrasable statement. The search for such a statement is what Brooks rejects. In contrast to Kivy, the philosopher of language Ernie Lepore has defended the unparaphrasability of poetry by appeal to what he calls hyperintentionality, which is a kind of linguistic context in which, in Lepore's words, replacing an expression with its synonym changes meaning. Lepore thinks that poetry exemplifies such a context and in this regard is similar to quotation. So, and this is his example, bachelor, might say, is synonymous with unmarried man, but substitution will not preserve meaning or truth in some contexts. For example, in the move from bachelor is the first word in bachelors are unmarried men to unmarried man is the first word in bachelors are unmarried men. Lepore claims that poems also create hyperintentional contexts. <coughs> Poetry, he writes, like quotation, doesn't support substitution of synonyms because it harbors devices for being literally, partly, about their own articulations. Lepore's suggestion reinforces the thought that there's more to the unparaphrasability of poetry than just the contingency of what can or cannot be done in practice. However, it's questionable whether poems really are, even partly, about their own articulation. That idea somehow seems too solipsistic, too inward-facing. And although hyperintentionality might give an insight into the semantics of poetry, it offers little more to an explanation of the value of poetry than already noted in the fact that in reading poetry, special attention is invited to the precise language used. The lesson that from the paraphrase debate is that what matters is not whether poems can be paraphrased, after all, most of them can, but whether the resulting paraphrase, even in cases of near absolute synonymy, is in any sense substitutable for or equivalent to the poem itself. And the default assumption is that it's not, and that rests on a judgment of value, not on a matter of semantics. I suggest the best way of thinking of unparaphrasability is less as a brute fact about poetic usage, more as a convention in the practice of poetry itself, not something discovered by readers in reading poetry, but something demanded within the practice. By way of a slight diversion, an amusing and I think telling example of sameness and difference of in poetry, sameness and difference of meaning, appears in a recent essay by the philosopher Sherry Irvin, an essay titled Unreadable Poems and How They Mean, in a volume edited by John Gibson titled The Philosophy of Poetry. It came out last year. <clears throat> 
Sherry Irvin cites some scathing remarks by the poet and critic Joan uh, Houlihan about avant-garde, postmodernist, contemporary poetry, claiming that it sometimes uses words in a way that treats them as meaningless. Houlihan suggests that the particular words of some poems are in fact inessential to them. Major substitutions can be made preserving the poem's identity. Again, her claim rests on a judgment of value, not on semantics. She gives an example, and this is um, Sherry Irvin's example, of a poem by Christina Mengert with the enigmatic title, Star. And this is the poem. This is the poem in its entirety. <coughs> is an axle's excavation an axiom's inversion that muzzles the ventriloquist breath of a nipple, the revolving door of its throat. Well, Joan <coughs> Houlihan, again, I think amusingly, offers the following as an essentially equivalent substitute. This is hers. I mean, she's poking fun, of course, but it's, there's a serious point underlying it. Is an axiom's evacuation an axle's inversion that snubs the ventriloquist bread of a testicle, the spinning jenny of its lashes. Houlihan writes, I would argue that my poem is the original. It is exactly the same poem, albeit with different words, but neither set of words makes any difference to the meaning. Go back to the two Samples there. Sometimes the suggestion is when meaning is so elusive and so hard to grasp, it doesn't seem to matter what that meaning is. <coughs> Houlihan's phrase, neither set of words makes any difference to the meaning, even if offered as hyperbole, is challenging. It suggests that it's not the words themselves that create meaning, or indeed the poem itself, but only certain formal qualities. The form, the sound, the rhythm, the meter substitutes for the meaning. There's no other meaning to be grasped in works of this kind. Her alternative is not a paraphrase, because strictly there is no meaning to paraphrase. The poem, she seems to be saying, has no semantics, and she takes this to be typical of some postmodernist poetry. Well, in fact, Sherry Irvin, very nicely discussing this example, actually comes to the rescue of the original poem, having cleverly discovered, no doubt using Google, another use of one of the key <coughs> phrases. And, and this is what... Um, uh, Irvin writes, the ventriloquist breath opens Lavinia Greenlaw's poem, The Iron Lung, something we might or might not be expected to know, published not long before Mengert's poem first appeared. If the ventriloquist breath is the breath induced by an iron lung, this brings new layers of resonance and possibilities of meaning to the poem. The axle's excavation now has a connection to a mechanistic action <coughs> of the iron lung. The revolving door of its throat may be connected to the relentless forcing in and out of breath. Irving notices that the move from muzzles to snubs, as is in Houlihan's rewriting, would undermine the sense of suffocation we have through the image of the muzzling of breath. So perhaps, after all, Christina Mengert's original poem does have a meaning to be recovered beyond its sound and form. But the example brings us to the very idea of form and content and their relation. Houlihan seems to suggest that in certain kinds of contemporary poetry, there is no more to content than some fairly abstract form. In fact, a more traditional debate makes a stronger claim for form-content unity. 
that the one cannot be identified independently of the other. Such a claim would explain why it should be that a paraphrase of a poem, however accurate, always seems inadequate, never equivalent to or substitutable for the poem. Again, though, philosophically speaking, the idea of form-content unity is puzzling. After all, it seems easy enough to speak of form and content separately, to identify a rhyme scheme, metrical patterns, stanza length, or poem type without mentioning what a poem is about, and to describe content, maybe skylarks, melancholy, yearning, and so forth, without mentioning formal qualities. So how could form and content be indivisible? The clue, I suggest, lies in the very idea of content in a poem. And the crucial idea, I suggest, is that specifications of content come in degrees of fine grainedness. We can specify content <coughs> in a coarse grained manner by identifying a subject matter, say a visit to Tinton Abbey, or broad themes, say melancholy. At this level, poems can share the same content, just as a poem and a paraphrase could. But the more fine-grained the specification, the less possible it becomes for that content to be shared. This response to Tintin Abbey, this account of melancholy. The question then arises, is it useful to identify a level of fine-grainedness such that only the poem itself counts as specifying its own content? If the answer is yes, then both form content unity and unparaphrasability are established. But again, arguably, it's not a fact about a poem that it exhibits form content unity, but rather a demand made of it when it is read or valued a certain way, not least when read as a poem. So what exactly is that value on which form content unity rests? Well, the value often cited is the unique experience that a poem affords, and so to my next section on experience. The idea that the value of a poem resides at least partly in a reader's experience of it is again puzzling for the analytic philosopher for whom the primary function of language is to embody and convey information or more, more widely to perform elocutionary acts. And anyway, the idea of experience seems troublingly vague. Can anything substantial be said? Well, no doubt the experience sought in poetry, and inevitably the focus turns to lyric poetry, is multifaceted. It's affective, cognitive, imaginative, and also visceral in response to the physical textures of language spoken. Just think of these lines from Gerard Manley Hopkins. The lushness of the lines, I suggest, is felt. Let me be to thee as the circling bird, or bat with tender and air-crisping wings, that shapes in half-light his departing rings, from both of whom a changeless note is heard. It's, of course, just a section of the poem. But the relevant experience is not just phenomenological or visceral in that sense. It emerges from that special kind of attention that poetry, especially the lyric, invites, in brief, an attention to a form-content unity. A subject is perceived and imagined through the forms of its presentation. What is experienced is the subject through a fine-grained perspective. The subject in this case, in the Manley Hopkins case, is the relation of the speaker to God, seen through the metaphorical perspective of the bird or bat circling round a light at night. 
the experience of a subject in this way through a specific perspective that a poem offers, linguistic and imaginative, will always be unique to each work. Of course, there's a high degree of subjectivity in the experience of individual readers, but there's also an important level of shared response. Well, grounding the value of poetry in experience is useful for several reasons. It connects poetry naturally to other arts, in particular painting, music, dance or sculpture, where experience is paramount. Yet it also, in illuminating ways, pulls poetry apart from other kinds of language use. Paradigmatically, the value of language resides in the communication of thought under the constraint of truth-telling. The shift to experience in poetry once again highlights the medium as much as the message, emphasizing the artistic over the merely functional. The experience that matters in poetry is the experience not of form alone or content of lo alone, but of the fusion of the two. So to my next section on interpretation. This emphasis on experience might also offer a different way of thinking about <coughs> poetic interpretation. Instead of merely linking interpretation to meaning in any straightforward sense, it might be more rewarding, so I think, to link it to experience, broadly conceived. This, I think, is where Peter Kivy goes wrong in equating paraphrase, which only connects to meaning, with, interpre with in interpretation. Interpreting a poem, including finding new ways of reflecting on its imagery or themes, can be viewed as a means of enriching the experience that a poem can offer, and also a way of encouraging other readers to expand their own imaginative response. So let me look at a, an example that's rather different from the resonating sound picture offered by Manley Hopkins, bat with tender and air-crisping wings. It's a lovely line. This is a more somber reflection by the First World War poet Wilfred Owen. The poem's entitled Futility. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once at home, whispering of fields unsown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep at all? Let me quote some interpretive comments by literary critic Henry Statton. He writes this. We're building up to this as part of a long passage of discussing the poem. We're building up to the climactic line. Was it for this the clay grew tall? The weight of irony in this line of the bitterest dashing of hope lies on the word this, on which the entire poem pivots. What a challenge for a reader to give this precisely the right pacing and intonation. It's a marvellous line. The clay grew tall, reminds us of the corpse as child and boy growing toward manhood and of Genesis. And this is, sorry, it's a long quotation. But it also takes us back to clays of a cold <coughs> star, which were invoked in connection with the triumph of the sun, and gives the question the larger sense, was it for this that the clay of earth came to life and eventuated in the human animal with its upright posture. When the clay of earth was first mentioned, however, it was to point to the triumph of the sun over cold, dead matter, whereas now clay is evoked with the dawning awareness that the cold is going to be the ultimate winner. The line needs to be read with the undertone of incipient anxiety. Well, the commentary, which as I say is part of a considerably longer passage, 
I think aids us in experiencing the mood of the poem. The sad transition from the warmth of the first stanza with the kind old sun and its gentle touch to the cold clay of the second, inducing <coughs> incipient anxiety. We are told to look out for the irony, the dashing of hope, the dawning awareness that the cold is going to be the ultimate winner. This doesn't give us the meaning as such, but it characterizes, elaborates on, and heightens the tone of despair or futility, as in the title, the poem was titled Futility. Analytic philosophers approaching interpretation in the arts have been drawn to a terminology and methodology that in my view, at least in the case of literature, has had a baleful effect, obscuring rather than illuminating the subject matter. For example, in the philosophy of literature, there is endless use of the phrase, the meaning of the work. It's not the singularity implied by the definite article that creates the problem. The phrase, a meaning of a literary work, I think is no better. The problem rests with taking the model <coughs> of sentence meaning as paradigmatic. The phrase, the meaning of the work, draws its inspiration from the phrase, the meaning of the sentence. That's where things go wrong because it encourages analytical philosophers to appeal to their own familiar theories of sentence meaning in talking about literary art. It might be Gricean notions of utterance or utterer's meaning, it might be speech act theory, it might be Davidsonian truth conditional semantics. But none of these, I think, capture what is distinctive about literary and especially poetic interpretation. In this context, it's important to acknowledge Munro Beardsley's well-known distinction between explication, explication, and interpretation. Explication does indeed investigate verbal or sentential meaning and is integral to literary critical inquiry. We need to know what individual words mean, the idioms, the connotations, the symbols, before we can appreciate poetic value. But interpretation, in the conception that interests me, and as illustrated, I think, in the Wilfred Owen example, has a different role. It applies not at a sentential or verbal level, but to whole works or sub substantial passages. And again, it's not meaning in any literal sense that it reveals, but something more like a vision or theme or value experienced. The emphasis on sentential meaning leading to the meaning of the work distorts key aspects in the practice of poetry, not least form content unity and the salience of verbal texture, sound, rhythm, rhyme, that we've already remarked on. For example, in resting on the paradigm of communicative speech, it gives undue weight to the question of intention the grasp of intended meaning is no doubt crucial to successful communication. But the search for intention is of minimal relevance for the kind of interpretation in our example, in the Wilfred Owen example. As a guide to experience, what matters in poetic interpretation is whether the text itself encourages, supports, and rewards the experience invoked. So I suggest that what's needed in the philosophy of poetry is a radical reorientation. Rather than thinking of a work of poetry, or indeed any literary work, as a text communicating an utterance meaning that invites understanding, and that's the standard paradigm, I think it's more fruitful to think of it as a work, a work of art, engaging a practice and inviting a distinctive mode of appreciation. The kind of commentary in our sample passage does not aim at recovering the meaning of the work or even at advancing understanding of the work in any literal sense. It aims rather at providing a perspective on the particulars of the work which enhances its interest and offers a further web of concepts through which to reflect on the work. 
So let me turn to expression. And we're doing time wise. I want to comment quite briefly on expression in poetry. I acknowledge that not all poems aim at expression, at least affective or emotional expression. But in the Western Romantic tradition, the lyric has been a dominant poetic form, as, for example, emphasized by Hegel. And it's here that we find subjectivity, expressiveness, and a personal response to a situation to be paramount. Conventionally, although not necessarily, lyric poetry in this tradition uses the first person, I. Some analytic philosophers, given familiar core interests in emotion, in reference, in the self, in I, and expressiveness in other contexts, have been drawn to reflect on this lyric tradition. Problems familiar to literary critics become refocused for philosophers. But again, I contend, as with the case of paraphrase and interpretation, that the intervention from analytic philosophers has not always been illuminating. Take this very simple lyric by Emily Dickinson. It was nice to find a, a poem that fits on a PowerPoint screen. This is the whole poem. My river runs to thee, blue sea, wilt welcome me? My river waits reply, O sea, look graciously. I'll fetch thee brooks from spotted nooks. Say, sea, take me. Well, the poem has an emotional intensity, pleading, yearning, take me. But who is the speaker, the I? Who is the addressee, the blue sea? What is the metaphor of the river running into the sea? Is it about death, the soul flowing into the vast sea of heaven? Is it about love? Is the speaker offering herself to a lover? <coughs> well, we need not linger on interpretation, but the philosopher will ask, what kind of speech acts are these? Is wilt welcome me a genuine question? Is take me a genuine command? J.L. Austin famously stated, we could be issuing any of these utterances as we can issue an utterance of any kind whatsoever in the course, for example, of acting a play or writing a poem, in which case, of course, it would not be seriously meant and we shall not be able to say that we seriously performed the act concerned. Munro Beardsley, as a spokesman really for the new critics, consolidated Austin's view, albeit in a less provocative formulation. He said, the writing of a poem as such is not an illocutionary act, it is the creation of a fictional character performing a fictional elocutionary act. The implication in both formulations, both by analytical philosophers, is that the speech acts in Dickinson's lyric are not real questions or commands. They are not seriously meant. But Austin has been frequently attacked on this point, not only in famous debates with critics like Jacques Derrida, Christopher Ricks, and Geoffrey Hill, but more recently by philosophers, most notably Maximilian de Gainsford, in a, who has written a series of articles on this. De Gainsford argues that in suitable circumstances, genuine performatives can occur in poetry, and it's important that this be recognized. So who is right here? What kinds of speech acts are possible in lyric poems? Underlying all this is a genuine fault line between what might be called romantic and modernist conceptions. The legacy of modernism is to, is to stress the autonomy of the work and to insist that if an emotion is expressed in a poem, 
then necessarily attribution of the emotion is to a poetic speaker or persona, not directly to the poet or to any psychological state of the poet. It's the language of the poem that is expressive on this view, and the linguistic mode is fictional. In contrast, the legacy of the Romantic tradition holds that poems, in particular lyric poems, reflect something deeply personal about the author, and even if the scenario depicted in a lyric is fictional, which it is sometimes, but not always, the poet's own sensibility is always on show. Well, lyric poems, poets, do indeed sometimes, perhaps even often, invent scenes that are both expressive and fictional. Emily Bronte's poem, Remembrance, is one such lyric in which the eye refers to a persona, not directly to Bronte herself. The example is famously discussed in an essay by F.R. Leavis. Emily Bronte's poem is a dramatic monologue Bronte envisages a lover returning to a loved one's tomb year after year, yet slowly <coughs> coming to move on, to relinquish the intense emotion that it stirs. <coughs> Sweet love of youth, forgive if I forget thee, while the world's tide is bearing me along. Well, Bronte's poem begins like this. Cold in the earth and the deep snow piled above thee, far, far removed, cold in the dreary grave. Have I forgot my only love to love thee, severed at last by time's all-severing wave? For those who stress the inherent fictionality of poetry, such dramatic monologues are paradigmatic, in effect expressive, but not personal or at least not autobiographical. For those who deny that the lyric is necessary deny that the lyric is necessarily fictional, these examples are neither paradigmatic nor in themselves impersonal. On the latter view, as it were the romantic view, Emily Bronte the poet, like Emily Dickinson in the earlier example, is deeply implicated in the nature and resonance of the expressed emotion. It's her emotion, even if not grounded in autobiographical fact. The philosopher Jennifer Robinson has sought a middle way between the two standpoints, the standpoints of what I call the modernist, autonomist view and the romantic, expressive view. Robinson calls her view a new a romantic theory of expression. While conceding a persona in first-person lyric poetry, Robinson insists on a place for the poet's own expressiveness and the role of poetry in the discovery of emotion. One example that she discusses is Shelley's lyric to a skylark, which famously begins like this, Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird, thou never wert, that from heaven or near it Pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. The poem, it's quite a long poem, the poem develops in an increasingly reflective, even philosophical mode. It goes on like this. Waking or sleeping, thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream. Or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Robinson writes of Shelley's poem, we get a sense both of the poet's wishes and values and of how those wishes and values affect his cognitive appraisals about the skylark and the human world. And she goes on, Shelley conveys his breathless awe at the bird's glorious song, as well as his downcast feelings on thinking about the world in contrast with the bird's song. 
he has given us his reflections upon his emotional experience as well as a sense of what the experience is like. The poem is the result of his cognitive monitoring of the experience. For Robinson, we cannot but mark the poet's own cognitive appraisals and emotional responses that inform the writing. The poem can reveal to the poet himself and to the reader the precise character of the emotion expressed. Sorry, and here's a bit more from that passage from Robinson. Once the poem is finished, the emotion expressed has been brought to consciousness. Both Shelley and the reader can now, as it were, look back on the emotional process described by the poetic speaker as his ideas and feelings develop through the poem. And we can now grasp exactly what emotion was being articulated. This, I suggest, marks a subtle and surely important refocusing on the poet in a full appreciation of the expressive lyric, a challenge to the more extreme demands of autonomy. It's simply wrong to think that lyric poetry is fictional all the way down. And so, briefly, to my final section on truth and profundity. A final topic on which analytic philosophers have had much to say is the so-called cognitive potential of literary works, in particular their role in seeking or disclosing truth. On this topic, as noted earlier, most attention has been directed at works of narrative prose rather than poetry. And that's natural enough, given that the novel <coughs> or narrative fiction makes its claim to truth primarily through the actions or attitudes of characters that invite moral, political, or even metaphysical appraisal. No doubt something similar is possible in certain kinds of poetry, like dramatic or narrative poems. And also, poetry or verse can be used directly as a vehicle for philosophy, like Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, for example, or Pope's essay on man. And poets, poets will often reflect on abstract ideas, even if these are not overtly philosophical. Nevertheless, the more characteristic emphasis in poetry, notably lyric poetry, on experience, subjectivity, expression, and content under a perspective suggests a different kind of truth from that sought by systematic philosophy or even the truth claimed for narrative fiction. The lyric poet might reflect on growing old, like W.B. Yeats saying an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. Or Philip Larkin, life is first boredom, then fear. Whether or not we use it, it goes. <coughs> But the interest of such lines is not primarily in the literal truth or otherwise of the extracted propositions, but in the way the thoughts are integrated into an aesthetic structure inviting the kind of experience that I was trying to characterize earlier. The critic Jonathan Culler, in his recent book on the lyric, has characterized what he calls a ritualistic dimension to lyric poetry that gives focus to memorable writing, quoting from color here, to be received, reactivated, and repeated by readers. Color is noting one of the pleasures of lyric poetry, notably, notably that written in the first person, which is to recite the lines as if from one's own point of view, to inhabit the sentiment from within. So can lyric poetry be profound? Well, indeed it can, but not in the mode of a philosophical treatise and not simply in virtue of being difficult to understand. We call a lyric profound when a sentiment or idea... And I've moved on from that, sorry. Um, when a sentiment or idea comes alive through us, for us through a sense that just this way of expressing it is right, the form exactly consonant with the content. 
That is true of the Wilfred Owen poem and also Shelley's To a Skylark. And even, I suggest, in Larkin's melancholic Dockery and Son, which I quoted one line earlier, with its ruminative lines, this is from the Larkin poem, where do these innate assumptions <coughs> come from? Not from what we think truest or most want to do. Those warp tight shut like doors. They're more a style our lives bring with them. Habit for a while, suddenly they harden into all we've got and how we got it. Look back on, they rear like sand clouds, thick and close. The profundity, I suggest, in Larkin's lines lies not in some abstracted thought about how personality and ambition are formed, but in just this way of realizing and embodying a thought. Truth and profundity in poetry lie in the clarity, integrity, and precision of the expression, which at its best can bear an authority that has the power to grip our minds and perhaps reshape our thoughts in fundamental ways. The themes might be perennial, mortality, beauty, despair, but the exploration of them through subjects as varied as a soldier's death, skylarks, or a train journey can offer a perspective that is entirely fresh and illuminating, and in that sense profound. Where a poem, as we say, strikes a false note, it's not so much a failure to correspond with reality, more a matter of sentimentality cliché or insincerity. The ideas or emotions expressed lack authority because they seem poorly thought out, too glib, derivative, or lacking precision. Poetry is profound through bringing to mind and crystallizing thoughts that are original, powerful, and effective. So a very brief conclusion. It's instructive for analytic philosophers to reflect on a conception of truth of this kind that seems fundamentally different from the propositional truth defined by philosophy. Indeed, all the topics briefly sketched here relating to poetry, practices, paraphrasability, form and content, poetic experience, expression, speech acts, and profundity, suggest ways in which thinking about language can be extended and enriched in this unusual context, well beyond the familiar paradigm of sentences imparting information and corresponding with facts. So thank you.